but so I don't know what it's about, but I um, didn't want to just hand something to defense counsel without having a discussion about it. Appreciate it. So for now, I'm just going to hold on to it, and we will proceed. Um, do we uh, are all the jurors here? Yes. And is the witness here? I can double check on it. Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and get the jurors. Did you mention this for your? <laughs> so that one's on me. Thanks. I owe you. Uh huh. Okay. Not nearly as much as he is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. You didn't get scanned, right? The scan. We're having a lot of problems with the scan not happening. Okay. If you need me to do something or inquire, let me know what's going on. I think not right now because the viewers are coming in. Okay. Morning, Ross. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Welcome to my resorts. Good morning, sir. Good morning, my lady. Sir. Sir. you up and you had the discussion what things were you talking about my clothes <clears throat> when you met with the district attorney on the first time about two or three weeks after the incident who was there in the room with you I believe it was Jacqueline and Rob just the two of them? Yes. So to be clear, that's Mr. Stevens and Ms. Ruth were here. Yes. Just wanted to. Was there an investigator named Mr. Acuna there? A C U N A? Yeah, that that name does ring a bell. The, the photos that we saw earlier, especially the ones with a, a finger holding your eye down, who took those photos? Jacqueline did. Ms. Blue. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Blue took that. <laughs> um, and was that meeting video recorded? I'm not sure. I can recollect, actually. Two and a half years ago. Well, it's been a little while. Yeah. Um, your most recent 
the, the one I think you said was about two weeks ago, that was video recorded? Yes. And um, do you know whether it was audio recorded? The, I'm talking about the initial statement in August, September of, of 2014. If there was audio recording of that meeting, I don't recall. Were you ever given a, a report or notes of that meeting to go over? No, I don't believe so. Are they, you looked at, you know what? Without opening your binder, can you tell me what documents you were provided? Copy of the police report, a copy of my original statement that I typed up in the Word document, and then a copy of the uh, hearing minutes. The preliminary hearing transcript? Is transcript, that? that's what it is. Sure. They're all stapled together, I have that. Okay. And by your police reports, that, that's, you were talking about the handwritten statement by Correct. Officer Truax? Correct. All right. Um, you may not remember this, it was a long time ago, but there was some, you testified that there was some confusion between your statements or, or some perhaps misinterpretation by uh, Officer Truax between your statements, what you said, and what she wrote down. Do you recall testifying to that? I recall saying something like that. It was really just in reference to the last item that was notated at the end. Okay. That it wasn't in sequence. Okay. But that's um, because it's something that I had said when the statement was finished and then I gave her that tidbit at the end and she put it out of sequence because she had already handwritten it, couldn't go back and put it in order. Okay, I, I'm talking about something different um, where you told her, if you recall, telling her sort of one one thing, without discussing what it is, I don't know that I recall, but telling her one uh, one thing that had kind of multiple parts to it and she only wrote down one part. That sound familiar? No. Give me a sec, we'll see if I can find it. No. Yeah, I'm just not sure what the I, question is. I understand. Um, what was your condition, mental state, when you wrote your, what we've been referring to as the typewritten report about four days later? Clear-headed. Still injured? Still injured. Well, uh, you know what kind of, what time of day or night it was? It was evening time. And you weren't on any medication, right? No, they actually had prescribed medication. I just didn't feel I needed to really take it. Okay. Um, the reason I ask is that you say in the written statement that Mr. Copenhaver didn't say anything and just jumped on it. You were pretty clear in both the preliminary hearing transcript and yesterday that he said what we've been referring to as WTF. Correct. He said that? He said that loud and clear. Okay. Just an omission in the, in the statement? Well, my first reaction when the lights come on, I saw him, is thinking, well, what do we say now? What's, because it's going to be a conversation in my mind, but I get the WTF and then, you know, okay. 1020 gets to the face, so I don't. And 20 hits to the face or five hits to the face? Oh, over 10. Can you explain why you wrote five hits in your written statement? Well, there was multiple times being hit. I got five in and then I put my hands up and got another five in and kept going until I pulled them down and flattened them out. This statement was written while it was freshest, while the events were freshest in your mind? Yes. And even before you gave your statement to uh, Ms. Blue, Mr. Stevens, and Mr. Acuna, Investigator Acuna? Correct. 
before I met with them. on your written statement um, when making your statements to Ms. Blue a couple of week or two later? To what extent did you rely on your notes? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that question for you. Did you bring them with you to the meeting? Yes. Did you look at them in describing what happened? I could have. Uh, you don't exactly recall? I mean, I don't recall every detail ago. of yeah, the, uh, that particular meeting. Was when I looked at my notes and when she asked me a question and when I answered the question by not looking at the notes or just have the conversation from the top of my head. Okay. The last line of questioning I want to get into is <clears throat> concerning what you would do when you went to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, can you describe just the sort of the first thing you learned in what I'll call BJJ? Sure. Uh, I remember learning how to do an ankle pick. What's that? That's where you put a submissive move around someone's ankle so that they'll want to tap out? This when they're on the floor or? Oh. I mean, yeah. I thought Good. ankle pick's kind of neat. I wrestled for four years and they don't teach you how to finish a move. They just teach you how to pin someone to the mat and match is over, so. Um, okay, and then what other moves did you did you learn? Did you come to learn? Uh, arm bar. What's an arm bar? That's where you twist someone's arm around and put leverage on it so that it inflicts pain so that they want to stop behind fighting. Behind the back? Is that yeah, behind could, the back? Could be behind the back or to the side. Um, that involve um, what's known as a pressure point? Well, you're applying pressure to someone's limbs, so you're trying to get them to stop fighting you or submit them. That's the whole idea of jujitsu. Is submission. Is submission. <clears throat> Did you ever learn a hold that was a restraint hold without, um, without the intent of putting someone to sleep? Yeah, all of them are restraint holds. Well, part of uh, if you take a hold too far and you've got leverage on someone's limb, you could rip their arm out or you could take their head off. Or I mean, anything's possible in, in our fight. When you go from a fight that's, you know, from training, learning moves and doing semi-live training, and you take that into something that's real, life and death, everything changes. Of course, I learned that for the first time. Okay. Um, Describe to me the next move that you learned in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or another move. <clears throat> another move is a, a choke around the neck. Um, and hold on a second. I'm bringing my own arm off around my throat with the elbow pointing out. Is it this type of choke? Yeah, putting your arm around someone's neck and restricting their air, air passage. And that's for the purpose of submission? Submission. Um, another move. Um, the rest of our are really just more to gain control, like putting in a lower guard. We practice the lower guard quite a bit. When someone's in an upper guard and they're, they're hitting you, bring them in to you so you have to flatten them out so that they don't hit you anymore. Uh, One second, please. Is that the, the upper guard? Is that what you described with respect to putting your hand behind Mr. Copenhaver's neck and pulling you in? Yeah, I was in the lower guard. That was a lower guard? I was in the lower guard. Well, you were in the lower guard. I'm, yeah, I'm going to look at diagrams, but without it, it's kind of hard to understand or visualize, you know? So. I, I do now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or I do now. Um, 
Okay, uh, another move. Well, I'm no jujitsu master, and it's been almost uh, eight, ten years since I did that. So, you know, I'm kind of running out of moves for you. But okay. if you want some training, you got a guy over there. He knows the stuff. Um, you learn any uh, any kicking moves? Not really. It wasn't kickboxing. Uh, did you learn how to use your weight? To drive someone, to drive someone, uh, basically to drive someone backwards. Maybe. Well, I was a collegiate wrestler for four years, and it was decent, pretty, pretty decent. So, yeah, I learned how to use my weight around. You know, I mean, you have to. Okay. Undefeated, as a matter of fact, in your junior, junior year. Career. Yeah, picture in the paper and all. <laughs> Very good. Very um, good. All county. Yeah. And that's San Diego County. That was actually Marin County. My junior Marin year, county. I spent in Marin County. Still a big county population was. I suppose. Fair enough. Um, so it was wrestling that, that taught you how to apply your weight to someone to get them to move the way you want them to move? Yeah. And was it that training that made you able to drive Mr. Copenhaver, whether it's his back or his head, that made that dent in the drywall? Yeah, training saved my life. Let's talk a little bit about your wrestling and your jiu-jitsu training. Um, when was the last time you competitively wrestled? What year? Uh, 1995. And uh, I believe you said um, during the cross-examination that you had not been to jiu-jitsu classes in about eight years? Yeah, I did jiu-jitsu 2005, 2006, around there. So it's been more than 10 years since you've done any yeah. jiu-jitsu? Yeah, I guess you had that up. It's close to 12 years. All right. Um, during any of your trainings, did they ever train you on how to um, handle situations where someone jumps on you while you're in bed? No. The, um, in this particular instance, on the early morning hours of August 8th of 2014, um, was this a uh, fair fight? No. Why not? Uh, I was asleep, and I got woke up to being ground and pounded. During this um, fight, were you able to use any of your uh, jiu-jitsu trainings? Were you able to get uh, Mr. Colton Haver in an armbar? No. Were you able to get him into an ankle pick? No. <clears throat> were you able to use any of your submission moves that you learned 12 years earlier? No. Throughout this entire fight, um, 
Were you concerned about your safety? Yes. What was going through your mind? Try not to die. All right. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the documents uh, you've reviewed in your, um, or prior to any of your meetings with uh, Ms. Booth and I. Uh, you said you uh, reviewed a police report. When you say police report, are you referring to the report that you or Ms. or Officer Truax wrote out for you? Yes. Okay. You didn't actually review a police report written by other officers about other events? No, I haven't seen anything else except that, actually. Okay. That's only about a page, maybe a page and another sentence. Okay. And I'll refer to that, then, as a voluntary statement. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, the statement that you uh, typed out a few days after the incident happened was um, did you type that out at the request of the district attorney's office? No, I decided that it was fresh in my head and this is much bigger than we thought it would ever be, so I had to get this stuff down. And why did you decide to do it soon thereafter? I just wanted to do it while it was as, as fresh as possible. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach your question? Yes. I have those marked as next in orders. <coughs> Your Honor, the state would move for the admission of state's proposed exhibit 163, the typed statement of Mr. Thomas. Any objection? No, there is not. Okay, submitted. All righty. Um, with that, Your Honor, am I allowed to publish today? Yes, go ahead. I'm going to uh, have you read um, significant portions of this. Okay. Okay? Uh, it should appear on your screen. If you want me to blow that up a little bit, I can. I can zoom in a little bit for you. Let me. You're doing brightness. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate your assistance there. Yeah, I can see it fine. All right, I just want to read a, a small portions of this, okay? Sure. Uh, let's start here where it says Christy. Christy and I fell asleep about <clears throat> Christy and I fell asleep at about 1 a.m. in her master bedroom together. At 1.55 a.m., the bedroom door opened and the lights were turned on, and without a word spoken in less than two seconds, War Machine jumped on top of me and was pounding on my face with his fists. I had been hit at least five times in the face before I could react by covering up my face with my hands. I could feel my, me, but my head, getting hit and trying to cover up <clears throat> as he was still throwing down punches. I reached up and grabbed him by the back of the neck and brought him close to my body to get him off balance and disrupt the mirage of punches he was smashing my face with. And at the same time, I put him in guard position, which temporarily stopped me from getting punched. By this time, I had taken about 20 hits to the face as I was holding lower guard and trying to figure out what's next, he bit my right cheek with full teeth. I felt it pushed, I felt it pushed him away. I tried to get to the side of the bed and foot on the ground, and he attacked me from behind with a stranglehold around my neck. I pivoted on one foot, spinning 180 degrees, and pushed off the bed riser into the closet while putting the back of his head into the wall, thus him releasing my neck. The closet wall, oh, the closest wall, I'm sorry, not closet wall, closest, the closest wall. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions. Do you recall uh, during the defense's cross-examination I'm asking you about why you wrote five times being hit in the face? Because I had felt myself get hit from side to side with my hands down mm -hmm. before I could get my hands up. And are you referring to this portion here? I had been hit at least five times in the face before I could react? Right. <clears throat> and after you were able to react, there were more punches coming. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, let me just read another couple uh, paragraphs here, and then I'll, I'll move on from this line of question. Can you also, read this? also in there, I'd said without a word spoken, I hadn't said a word. Okay. Not All that right, he hadn't you. said something, but I didn't. Okay. And then, if you'll read this second paragraph for me here, starting with "We landed." We landed on the floor, and as we came down, he was now on top, throwing more punches at my face, where he smashed down another 10 to 20 hits on my face. I tried to roll and was stuck in a walkway to the bathroom, where he immediately put another strangle choke on my neck. I was looking up at the ceiling of Christie's bathroom thinking, holy shit, I can't believe I'm going to die in Christie's bathroom. This is not what I expected. 
He had me good. There was no air and I knew I had seconds before blacking out and dying. I dropped my chin, turning my head at the same time and ran my hand up my neckline to break his choke. Finally, air. Trying to catch my breath as he started in with punches again, I could tell he was starting to slow down now. He was starting to talk and trying to ask me questions while still trying to hit me and gain a position for another choke. Then he had another choke, but I had a block up, and he started in with the questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. You're welcome. The, I want to talk to you a little bit about these chokes that he had you in, okay? Uh, there was um, the initial choke, and this is my understanding. Please correct me if I'm inaccurate. Mm -hmm. but my understanding was uh, that the first choke kind of happened when you are rolling off the bed, and then he jumps on your back. Correct. Okay. Tell me about that choke. Uh, did it impede your breathing? Yes. Were you uh, nervous about the hold he had on your neck? Absolutely. That's why I spun around and kicked into a wall. Um, the next choke that occurred when you were on the ground. Yeah. Okay. And that was kind of between the entry and that we previously discussed. Yeah, where those two stairs are. Um, and this one you said was significant also. That was that was high and tight, deep. Yeah, That's I was starting to see stars, and I was, it was, I was on my way out. So it's either you, you break through this and you breathe, or you're done, and maybe you wake up, maybe you don't. You don't know what's going to happen. Okay. <clears throat> in, the, um, in all the chokes he put on you, did it impede your breathing? Yes. Floor, sorry. Fair enough. Um, the uh, somewhat more recent meeting within the last couple of weeks uh, was that on the tenth floor of the major violators unit. Yes, that I can recall. That's tenth floor. And were those different offices at that time? Yeah, they were. They are different offices. Okay. <clears throat> are you receiving any monetary value from your testimony today? No. Any uh, fame or publicity? Quite the opposite. I wanted to talk to you um, a little bit uh, more about uh, Ms. McIndey. Um, Ms. Uh, McIndey, did she use any drugs or alcohol? No. I think that's why we had a good relationship. Neither of us used drugs or alcohol. Okay. The there was a period of um, time going back to the Monday before the incident. I believe that would have been on August fourth. Uh, at that time, he said that you exchanged several different text messages with uh, Ms. McIntyre because you yes. felt like there was a pulling away or a distancing. A little bit of a distance. Yeah. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I don't believe there's any injection of these, but for the record, let me put on the record what uh, the state is seeking to admit at this time. 
That would be states proposed exhibits. So let me go back in order here. One sixty four through one seventy one. Any objection? Uh, there is isn't. They're admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, I kind of want to go through these. Are these some of the texts that you received from Ms. Mack on August 4th? This is Exhibit 164. Yeah, this is our conversation. All right, and it's about 144 in the afternoon on Monday? It is. Okay. <coughs> Down here towards the bottom at 154, you say you're not feeling very well. Yeah. Oh, I apologize. I forgot I zoomed in. Thank you, Ms. Booth. Uh, down here towards the bottom, it says that uh, you're not, you feel bad today. Yeah, that's right. You go on to discuss that? Yeah. This is Exhibit 165, Your, uh, Your Honor. Uh, okay. What are we looking at here? My texts are in green, hers are in gray. Okay. And uh, this is a <clears throat> conversation that we had on Sunday after a war machine had left her residence and on his way back to San Diego. Okay. And you knew that based upon uh, some of the social media that he had left? Yeah. Okay. This was the, the next day, actually. This was Monday, so he left on Sunday. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, down here, there's a text message from uh, Ms. McIndae's phone. It says, I know I haven't been giving you enough attention lately. I'm sorry. And then let me show you the next text. This is Exhibit 166. Uh, is this your response? Yeah, that's and my response. Could you read the green response for me, please? I say, yeah, there's that, but I know why, so that's why I feel this way. It's out of my hands anyways. You have to do what makes you happy. If you care to talk, let me know. I'd rather see you face-to-face -face anyways. Texting, texting this sucks. All right. And she responded to you. This is Exhibit 167. Mm -hmm. uh, would you read that response, and I'll note for you that it's somewhat out of order. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I fall easily back into old habits. I don't know if I'm <clears throat> really happy. I don't know how to make myself really happy. I don't know if anyone else does either. I'm stuck in an internal battle with what would be the right thing and what would make me... Let me give you that further here. This is yeah. the next exhibit, 168. Uh, two, three, four. Right here. What would make me... What would make me happy. It's not fair to have you but I love having you around and I enjoy your company so much. You're so sweet and kind to me. You're supportive and compassionate. The way you care for me is like something I haven't felt, <clears throat> haven't felt in a long time, but I can't give you 100% of myself and I'm not even sure why really. And then you, did you respond to her after that? This is exhibit 169. Yeah. And uh, what is it that you told her? You don't necessarily have to read it, but kind of your summary of it. Uh, it's, I mean, it says exactly what it is. I feel you. This is better for us to do in person. There's still a lot you don't know about me, and probably time for us to have a real conversation about all the basics. I'd like to do that tonight, so if it's not, so it's not ling lingering over my head for another week. Um, and then she decided uh, she'd come over that night, so it was raining, and I told her to drive the rover because out here it floods. Um, just another couple other questions. Um, yesterday, uh, defense counsel was asking you a question, and tell me if you recall this question, where um, defense counsel asked you if you forgave uh, uh, Ms. Mack for her part in this incident. If you recall that question. Mm -hmm. okay. What did you, you responded, yes. Your and point. what did you mean by that? What did you forgive Ms. Mack of? Well, I understand the situation. You're a small girl. You've been getting beat previously by your ex-boyfriend. You're scared to death of him. You start your mom to kill her that you live with. I could understand the fear factor that is engulfed. she's engulfed in. Um, and it's like someone coming out of their shell for the first time. How does she know she can trust me? How does she know that I'm not the same kind of person yeah, as him? I'm going to object. That's, that's assuming her state of mind and speculation and move to strike the entirety of that answer. All right, so uh, okay. sustained, I'll strike the last answer, and jury will disregard it. Okay. So try to ask a more specific question, I, I guess. Um, regarding the incident on August 8th, um, you said that you forgave her. Um, did you feel like, um, I guess let me ask you more directly, what did she do wrong during that in order for you to forgive her? 
Well, what did you mean by your answer yesterday? I think that's a better question. Well, I had no pre-warning about that relationship. She hadn't spoken up on the Monday night to me about what was going on with her and him. I didn't know that he had a key to her house. I didn't know that uh, he was planning on coming there, or if she had any plans of him coming there, I didn't know any of that. Okay. You know? All right. Um, during that incident, did you believe, uh, during that attack, did you believe that you were going to die? Yes, I did. No, no, I'll pass the witness. Recross? There is not. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, sir. We do appreciate your time. You're welcome. State calls uh, Mary Ann Truax. Raise your right hand. Face that gentleman right there for me. You saw this swear the testimony you're about to give this action. Give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. Yes, I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Can you state your complete name, spelling both your first and last name for the record? My full name is first name Marianne, M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Last name is Truax, T-R-U-A-X. Thank you. Can I proceed? Yes. Thank you. Um, how are you employed? I employ with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department as a police officer. Uh, officer Truax, how long have you been employed by uh, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department? I've been employed for about six years. Uh, are you currently assigned to any particular um, division or unit? I'm assigned to Bolden Area Command. Patrol. Patrol, alright. Yes. And are you currently um, a field training officer or trained to become one? Yes, sir, currently right now. And what, is, do, what do field training officers do? We are um, obviously supposed to uh, train new officers coming onto the department after the academy. We train them, we supervise them, and we ultimately evaluate them until they, you know, they go through the whole program. Okay. I want to draw your attention to uh, the early morning hours of August 8th of 2014. Do you recall that morning? I recall it. I do recall it. I just don't recall it every single action, but I do recall. I do recall the incident, yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall what shift you were working on August 8th? Um, I was working the graveyard shift. And what area were you working in? I was working in Southeast Area Command at that time. Were you working with any other officers that night? Yes, I was partnered up with um, Officer Shepard. And at that time was Officer Shepard also known as Officer uh, Shoemaker? Yes, sir. When you say you're working with her, is she uh, in the patrol vehicle with you? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Were you dispatched to the area of Pueblo Way, that street? Yes, sir. Uh, and you recall about what time it was that you were dispatched there? I don't recall. Was it the early morning hours at or around 2 o'clock in the morning? Yes, it was, yes, it was the early morning hours, yes. <laughs> and um, I'm assuming that you responded with Officer Shepard slash Shoemaker? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What were the details of the call that uh, took you out to come away? From what I can remember, it was details what the female had called in with an open line. Uh, she was screaming and heard banging on the walls. Now, from your patrol vehicle, are you able to actually listen to the 911 call themselves? No. So the information you have was an open line with a female screaming in the background? Yes, sir. What did you do with that information? Let me ask you more clearly. Yeah. What? <laughs> more directly, maybe. Uh, did you go to Pueblo Way? Yes, we, we arrived on the, we arrived at the in the neighborhood first. Um, we I remember 
unrolling my window to see if we could hear anything. You know, first use my, you know, my, my, you know, hearing, vision, things like that to see if I can see anything, hear anything in the strange neighborhood. Um, we searched the neighborhood with our spotlight to see where the addresses were because they were, you know, pretty large homes at that area and then the addresses aren't really visible like it would in a, a regular neighborhood. So we're looking around, we're, we're shining our spotlight and then we, um, we located the address that was on the call. Um, do you want me to go through everything? Uh, yeah, let, let, me, let me stop there and ask you a couple more questions. When you were initially dispatched, did you know exactly what uh, address or residence you were going to? Yes, we knew what residence we were going to, yes. And how was it that you were able to obtain that address? Well, we have um, a website, and I'm unclear exactly what this entails, because I'm not an expert. Only tell me what you know. It's, it's called Gizmo, and it's a, how it's explained to me is that it's a website that the dispatchers use. They get the latitude and longitude from the cell phone. I don't know how they get that, but they get that information. And then the website, it drops a pin on the, um, the, uh, the location of the, lat and the latitude and longitude uh, decimal points. Okay. And then that's how we got the address. Okay. And you recall that address being 3482 Pueblo? Yes, I do. Okay. And that was the address that Gizmo identified? Exactly. That, yeah, Gizmo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what did you do when you arrived at 3482 then? Well, from what I can remember, we went up to the door like we would normally. Um, I don't recall what the mail was doing. I, I don't know if he was already out there or not. Um, I don't recall any of that. But I know when we did talk to him, nonchalant, just, hey, nothing's going on. You know, he was just, why are you here kind of kind of okay. deal. Let me, let, me, let me ask you a couple more questions okay. regarding that. So when you arrived at 3482, um, there's somebody already outside? I don't recall that myself, oh. okay. um, but later on, other um, officer she maker recalls that. I don't recall that. So okay. you have to ask her about that specifically. Oh, I testified to what Exactly. You mean, I know. What you know. So I don't recall if he was standing outside, okay. but right. we did make contact with him first. Okay. Uh, then tell me what happened after you made contact with him then. Um, he said he was... You, you can't tell me what he said either. <laughs> Sorry. After you spoke, well, what I, happened? After I spoke with him, we, we asked to speak with his wife. We spoke with her. She was, he claimed that she was asleep, so we, he, she, he woke her up. She said everything was fine. We didn't hear, see anything in the neighborhood strange. And so that's when we left. You know, we, I think, I can't remember exactly what we did, but we, we had left the residence, went to our vehicle, said, hey, everything is code four out here. That's just terminology we use for, you know, no emergencies existing right now. And um, at that point, I don't recall if we'd driven up the neighborhood. I don't recall that. But then I know we eventually left the scene. Okay. All right. Um, Matthew, focus on what you do remember and telling us what you don't remember. Okay. All right. The, um, when you were at the uh, 3482 address, you spoke to a male and a female? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, did you enter their residence at all? No. Um, after speaking to them, did you strike that out? I'll move on to a different set of questions here. Um, when did your shift end that night? It ends at 8 o'clock. Is that 8 o'clock a.m.? Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. After, um, after you responded to this 3482 address, did you ever, were you ever asked to respond to a, another call that was potentially related to that earlier call? Yes, we were asked okay. to respond to the hospital. Okay, which hospital? Sunrise Hospital. And what did you do when you got to Sunrise Hospital? We, well, what I did was I went and talked with the male, uh, Corey Thomas. I spoke with him and, and tried to get his statement verbally. Um, was he able to speak to you? Yes, he was able to speak to me, yes. Was he um, able to write out a, a written statement for you? No, he was not. And do you know whether or not a written voluntary statement was filled out? Yes, I do. And how was that done? I, I went ahead and wrote it for him. He, he told me and I wrote it out. 
Did you attempt to be as accurate as possible with his statements? Yes. <clears throat> what else did you do at the hospital after you spoke to Mr. Thomas? I um, went to the FEMA victim and asked her, I, I gave her a, um, what we call a consent to search card, so we can, other officers that were at the actual residence, her residence, could gather evidence. So that's what I did. And this consent to search card, this would give you permission then to enter the home to do a search? Would, and yes, to, yes, it would. Okay. Were you successful in obtaining a consent to search from Ms. McIntyre? Yes, I was. Um, the, I want you to describe the, uh, as far as what you can remember, can you describe the injuries of Corey Thomas for us? I don't recall. This was several years ago? This was, yes, two and a half years ago. Uh, what is the purpose of your, uh, of patrol officers when they initially respond to a potential crime scene, um, when they speak to witnesses? What's kind of the purpose of the patrol officers? Well, we want to get the initial story. Pretty much we just want to get the initial story to document it and then, and then ultimately write a report. But we're there just to get the story initially right then while it's still fresh. Okay. And after you get that story, uh, what is it that you guys do with the case? What we do is we'll document it on our, on our crime report. And then if, if, then at that time we would um, call the, de the, de the detective detail that would cover whatever. If it was a, if it was domestic violence, we'd call their detail. If it was a robbery, we'd call robbery. Okay. And then they would respond if needed. In this particular case, do you recall whether or not any detectives responded to the hospital? Yes, the domestic violence detail detectives responded and came to the hospital. Of course, I'm going to A couple more questions. Uh, can you describe Corey's demeanor for us when he was at the hospital? I don't recall specifically what his demeanor was. It was a long time ago. I'm currently now, I haven't technically started with getting new officers, but I technically am a field training officer. And you've been employed for six years? Yes. And what type of training did you experience? What type of training? Yes. Uh, the academy training, um, just, you know, six months of the academy. Um, others, other classes, we did defensive tactics. We've done, you know, I've done some narcotics training, things like that, just typical police training. Um, you stated that you uh, help show up on scene, you document initial statements, correct? Yes, that's one of my duties, yes. And are these statements typically recorded? They're, they're typically written first when I show up, but the detectives could record it later. So me, no, I don't record statements. Okay, now you hand wrote Mr. Thomas' statement, correct? Yes. And after writing out the statement, did you give it to him to review for accuracy? I don't recall. Typically in your training and experience when you deal with the witness, after writing out their statement, do you have them review it? What I typically do is I will, I will review it first and then I don't typically give it to them, but I'll read it out to them and say, hey, is this what you, is this what you uh, want to say or is this what happened? And this statement that you had taken down, he signed it, correct? Who did what? Mr. Thomas, you signed this statement, correct? I don't recall. Why would you have a, a witness sign a statement after you write it out for them? Because you still, he has to still, he or she still has to, um, I don't want to say swear to its validity, but at least saying that, yes, what I'm saying is true. And you said you're working with your partner, Shoemaker, correct? Yes, sir. And um, here in the police report it says, McIndae completed a voluntary statement by audio interview, and Thomas completed one by dictation to a responding officer. That would have been you, correct? Well, can you read that again? I'm sorry. McIndae completed a voluntary statement by mm -hmm. audio interview, 
Okay. And Tom has completed one by dictation to a responding officer. Yes, that would be me. Yes. And that was you. Yes. And what did you do with the uh, audio recording the interview? The audio recording? I didn't do anything with it that much. That wasn't us as patrol officers. That most likely was a detective who did the audio recording. And were you familiar with that audio recording? I'm not. And you're not familiar with who took that audio recording? I am not. Now, you said when you were dispatched, you were dispatched down Pueblo Way, correct? Yes, sir. And when you arrived, you rolled down the windows? Yes, sir. And uh, approximately what speed were you going down the street? I don't know. I don't recall. Um, I wasn't driving. Okay, but you rolled down the windows so you could hear, correct? Yes. And uh, so I presume we are moving very slowly? Yes. I just don't know the speed. Okay. And um, how was your hearing? Oh, pretty good. Do you have any problems with it? No. Okay. Nothing out of the ordinary, no. Okay. And uh, did you, prior to getting to 3482, did you at all get out of the vehicle? Before arriving? No. No? No. And so when you got to 3482, at that point, you exited the vehicle? Yes, sir. And was that both you and Shoemaker? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, upon arriving at the scene, was there a garage door open with two individuals smoking inside of the garage? I don't recall. You want to take a second to think about it? Excuse me? Would, would you like to take a second to think about that? I don't recall. Okay. And uh, you said you spoke with a husband and a wife, correct? Yes, sir. After speaking with the husband, why did you speak with the wife? We need to make sure that everybody in the residence is not hurt or they need help or anything like that. We need to speak with everyone, especially if there's a female, since there's a female on the call, if there's a female in the residence, we have to speak to them. And after speaking with both the husband and wife, did you, did you determine whether or not that, that phone call came from them? We did not determine that, no. We determined by their demeanor that there was nothing wrong, but we couldn't, we, we couldn't you know, put the two, two together. Okay. And how did you feel upon leaving? Uh, did you have any concerns for them? No, I did not. Your Honor, I asked the witness in regards to what mm -hmm. she observed upon uh, arriving at the scene and uh, she does not recall. Uh, I would like to refresh her recollection with the dispatch log. May I do that? Sure. Permission okay. to approach? Yeah, sure. Are you familiar with the documentation <coughs> placed in front of you? Yes. And is that a dispatch log? That is a dispatch log, yes. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to review that? After reviewing that, does that help refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So upon arriving on scene at 3482, what did you what did you see? Well, this is this in that's typed in here is my partner's words. She okay. typed so that in. What do you remember? I do not remember him in the garage smoking. I mean, that's I do not remember that. As of right now, I can't remember if he was actually in the smoke in the garage smoking or we knock on the door. I cannot recall that. And in here it's saying it was true, but I don't recall. And your partner was driving, correct? <clears throat> yes, sir. After leaving the uh, 3482 house, did you continue to patrol the street to search and see if uh, possibly that call came from any other house? Yes, it was a dead-end street, and we just went to the dead end, and we did a slow patrol through there, and then came out because it's a dead end, it doesn't, we have to, one way in and one way out. Sure. And approximately how many houses are on that street? 20, 15, 20 maybe. 15, 20? Yeah. Okay. I don't know the exact number. And uh, you said that you went by with the windows down. Were you able to hear uh, anything that stood out? No. Okay. And did you at all, at any point in time, hear any dogs barking? Yeah, yes. And did you draw your attention to those houses where the dogs were barking? No. You did not? No. Nope. Um, can you describe the, uh, the pattern of barks? Was it um, essentially loud and obnoxious as if uh, to alert you that something was happening? 
or was it just faint as if a, a dog was recognizing the vehicle? Just a dog would recognize there's somebody, you know, movement in the neighborhood, nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. And you said that you received from Ms. McIndae a consent to search, correct? Yes, sir. And did you go back to that house? No, I did not. And were you aware of uh, whether or not there was any dogs removed from the property? I do not know. Satchel be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help to God. Thank you. Thank you. You can see it. Can you state your complete name spelling both your first and last name for the record? First name is Somalia, S O M A L I A. Last name is Shepherd, S H E P H A R D. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Officer Shepherd. How are you employed? Employed with LVMPD as a police officer. Okay, and just um, for those of us, or I know what it means, but LVMPD is Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department? That is correct. Thank you. And how long have you been with the police department? Nine years and eight months. Um, and what is your current position within the department? Patrol. And in 2014, were you also in patrol? Yes, I was. Just briefly, can you give the ladies and gentlemen of the jury an idea of just the typical job duties of a patrol officer? Uh, typical job duties as a patrol officer include responding to calls for service, um, proactive work, making vehicle stops, person stops, um, taking police reports. Go on there. Is there more? <laughs> uh, that's the gist of it. Okay. So, hypothetically, you know, a 911 call comes in um, and, and units need to go. Um, initially, patrol are the officers that usually almost always respond first. Is that that correct? is correct. Now, when patrol officers respond, what are your job duties in the very beginning stages of any investigation? Um, basically, we want to identify who we're coming in contact with. Um, well, just to backtrack, we get details of a call, uh, we respond to that location, and then from there, we make contact with victim, um, suspect, whomever the case may be, and just do a preliminary investigation, reference what happened, what's going on. If we do have probable cause for arrest and we do have a suspect present, we will make an arrest, but if we don't, then we typically do a police report with the information we did get from a victim. Now also, if this is a type of crime that needs an investigation, for instance, like, um, oh, let's say you go to a, rob a robbery scene, would it be your role to go get the preliminary details and then either you or your sergeant contact the robbery unit and they take over the investigation? That is correct. All right. So I'd like to turn your attention now to the early morning hours of August 8th of 2014. Um, were you working in patrol um, during that time period, during that day? Yes. And what were the, could you give us the parameters of kind of the area in which you were patrolling? Um, I worked Southeast Area Command, which pretty much includes everything east of Maryland Parkway, pretty much all the way up to Henderson um, Mountains up there. So off the top of my head, I can give you the borders, but. Okay. Um, That's good. So I just want kind of a general idea of where you guys covered. Um, so I'd like to talk to you specifically about um, a call that came in through dispatch to you around 1.55 in the morning. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and can you give me an idea of the information that you were given um, that made you respond to a certain area? Uh, yes, I responded to a um, 404, which is a 911 disconnect or unknown trouble 
or excuse me, an unknown trouble call. Um, details in that call just stated a female was yelling, let go of him, and sound like arguing, yelling in the background. Okay. Now, you don't get to actually hear 911 calls, correct? No, I do not. Someone calls 911, they speak with dispatch, and then dispatch communicates with you. Correct. We get a call on our screen with that information and get assigned to a call. Okay. So you are assigned and um, when that information comes up on your screen, where are you told to go? To the address on the screen. And what address was that? That was 3482 Pueblo. And do you have an understanding of how um, dispatch figured out that address? Um, per gizmo? which is basically, I guess, I'm not too good with the technical stuff, but there's a ping on the phone, triangulation, and basically, I don't know if it's their computer, because again, I don't know their job exactly sure. what they do to get that information, but pretty much from there, they just guess this address, or this is the address, and that's where we were dispatched to. Okay, so do you respond um, soon after receiving the call in from uh, or the information? I believe I wasn't assigned to the call to about 2.15 to 14 a.m. Okay. And so if we have information that comes in about that the 911 call came around 1.55 a.m., you're not notified to respond until like 2.12, between 2.12 or 2.15? Is that what you said? So basically it depends um, if we have officers available um, or not to go to it and kind of once someone clears or you assign yourself or get assigned to it. So. In that case scenario, if it came out at 155, but we got assigned at 215, I possibly was on a call prior to okay. that one, or when that one originally came out. So you get assigned around 215 to go to the residence? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you get into the neighborhood, um, do you make contact with any residents at the, uh, did you say 3482? Yes, I did. Um, did you make contact with the residents at 3482? Yes, I did. When you arrived, um, were you working alone with the partner? I was working with Officer Truex. Okay, and she's the individual who just left the courtroom? That is correct. Okay. Um, when you and Officer Truex approached the home, is there anyone in the garage of the home? About 3482, there is a male in the garage area. Okay. Um, and I don't want to get into what he said because that would be hearsay, but were you able to have a conversation with him? Yes, I was. Did anything seem wrong with him? Did he seem agitated in any way? No, not at all. When, um, because the, the, there had been a, a female heard on the 911 call, do you request him to get his wife so you can speak with her? Yes, we did. And did the wife come down and speak with you? Yes, she did. Um, did she seem fine as well? Yes, she did. So after your conversations with these two individuals, did you believe everything was fine at that residence? I did. Um, and did you then, what's called, close out the call? Yes, I did. And then did you then leave the neighborhood? I did. Okay. Um, Later on, in, and I should be clear, that uh, CAD, which is kind of what shows what times everything was done, shows that the call was closed out at about 2.30 in the morning. Would that, would that be correct? Yes. Okay. So I'd like to now turn your attention to the early, well, not the early morning hours, because it would be later than the 1.55 time period, but around 5, 6 in the morning, were you dispatched to Sunrise Hospital? Yes. And what was your understanding of why you were going to the hospital? Um, the victim referenced a... Battery 417, or excuse me, what the 400 goes, a uh, domestic disturbance call was being transported to the hospital. Um, units were being assigned to attempt to locate the suspect in this said call, um, and no one was assigned to the hospital, so myself and Officer Truex went to the hospital, made contact with the victim. Um, and so you, did you respond to the hospital? Yes, I did. And did you make contact with um, someone known as Ms. McInnay? Yes, I did. And uh, did you also make contact with someone known as Mr. Thomas? I did. At the hospital, did it um, ever occur to you that, did you ever make the connection that these were the individuals that were involved in the previous phone call that you had responded to earlier in that morning? Yes, once hearing the street name, um, and then again after seeing, okay, well, the statement of like go of him, possibly two and two together. Um, also after asking Christy for what her phone number was and matching that to the original call. I realized this is possibly related and that was probably the 911 call. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions in regard to uh, Ms. McIndate and Mr. Thomas. As you approached 
um, the hospital. Were you were you dealing with one or the other more, and was, was Officer Truex dealing with one or the other? How did that work out? I feel like it was a lot of both, a lot of back and forth. Um, I did type both reports for each victim, so there was a lot of going from one room to other room and a lot of stepping outside, make phone calls, and trying to get phone reception. So I should ask, is the, the phone reception really bad at Sunrise Hospital? In that area, yes. Okay. So in regards to Ms. McIndy, can you explain to me physically what you she looked like upon your arrival? Oh. Jeez, her face was completely swollen, um, both eyes just puffy, closed, her teeth were, two of her teeth were missing, tried blood around her nose, around her mouth, um, she had bruising on her leg, just complained of pain, just traumatizing to see, just. Can you explain to me her demeanor? She seemed scared, she seemed tired, she seemed... very soft-spoken, just, I don't know, just scared still. Was this a hard call to go out on? It was, again, just seeing a victim like that. I think the doctor's taking some time to answer her questions. I think there's a little bit of emotion, so I'm just trying to explain. Um, when, I can't get into what Ms. McIntyre says because that's hearsay, but was she able to communicate to you the preliminary details of everything? Yes, she was. Now, as I spoke about in the beginning, and was asking questions um, in the beginning of your testimony, um, your job duties there at the hospital, are you conducting a full investigation or are you just getting the preliminary details? Just the preliminary details. So when you get those preliminary details, um, do you record her statement or do you just kind of type out some of the things that she stated to you. Type and write down some of the things she says to me. Um, and you said that you also had contact with Mr. Thomas. Uh, do you remember any injury, if he had any injuries? Thomas as well, I mean, just face completely bloody, full, and just dry blood everywhere. Uh, we had information, or we had testimony from Officer Truix. He had, um, Mr. Thomas filled out what's referred to as a voluntary statement, um, but when I say filled out, he actually orally spoke and Officer Truitz wrote that out. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, does that happen in certain cases? In certain cases, yes. Why would it be that a witness wouldn't write it out themselves? If they're unable to, because of, um, obviously if they're, what's the term I want to, basically they're unable to write it because either they're shooken up, they're, Injured somehow, some way, and her hand hurts, they can't hold a pen. And in cases like that, we would write it and just put on it written by as told by. Okay. And it was your, or were you there when Mr. Thomas um, was speaking to Officer Truitt and she filled out the statement? Back and forth. I would say I was there the whole time, but I was in the room during the time she How would you explain his demeanor while you were at the hospital? Um, he seemed upset and very angry. Um, Again, just in pain as well, just. Did he? Could you object? That's black salvation. A little. Um, at this point in time, did, had you guys located the suspect? No. Had either of those individuals identified the suspect who you should be looking for? Yes. Um, after you and Officer Truex are able to speak to Ms. McIndy and Mr. Thomas, um, you then memorialize these things in, in the police report? This is leading. Did, I'll rephrase things. Did you then memorialize um, your investigator, preliminary investigation in a police report? Yes, I did. Um, so after you fill out your reports, what is the next thing you do? So basically, the reports were completed probably back at the station due to the fact that I lost my connection with the Wi-Fi. We didn't have air cards back then. Okay. Um, but was your question more so what did I do after leaving the hospital? Yes, what did you do after the hospital? Um, after leaving the hospital, I went back to the scene, made contact with my sergeant where detectives were at. 
And was it your understanding that um, another investigative unit, such as the domestic violence unit, would be taking over the investigation? Yes, it was. Um, after you uh, went to the scene, did you do anything further at the scene, or were you just there making sure everything was okay? There, making sure everything's okay, making contact with my sergeant before headed back to the station. And um, at that point, um, again, the home was considered a crime scene, so I wasn't able to walk in to see any of that. Okay. Um, and once you get back to the station, is it then when you're able to upload your reports into the system? Um, clarification, and I'm not 100% sure. I do know one of them was checked out to a detective, so I was unable to check it back into myself. But, Can you explain how that process works? So basically we have, um, we now type all our reports, we all handwrite them when it comes to incident crime reports. And with that said, um, it's uploaded into a system and when it's checked in by you, the user, you are able to access that report. Once you submit it, it'll go to a sergeant, detective, whomever, or if someone were to pull up that event number to view it, they could view it. So if it's locked out to me, I can't edit or do anything new to it. So So someone else had um, access to one of your reports and was viewing it? Correct. Um, would that be common for like, a, if, it, if it's domestic violence uh, detectives that are taking over, would that be okay and common for them to go yes. pull up your reports? Yes. Okay. So after you do uh, upload one of your reports, um, at that point in time, is your job over and the investigation is turned over to the domestic violence unit? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And that's all I have. If you're on the back conclusion of direct examination, I'll pass the witness. Thank you. Cross. Nine years, eight months. And the morning of August 8, 2014, you were working with her? Officer Truex. And you responded to 3482, Marble, correct? That is correct. And you were describing a little bit about this thing called Gizmo, correct? Correct. In the nine years, how many times have you responded to calls where addresses were provided uh, through Gizmo? Um, I couldn't count, but probably a few, quite a few. Can you give me an estimate? Are we talking hundreds here over the nine years? Mm, no, not necessarily hundreds. It just kind of depends if we get an address, if it was an open line or not. So I guess you would just have to look at how many unknown trouble calls I responded to to give you an exact number on that. Okay, so you said that they use what's called triangulation, correct? Correct. And in the nine years of your experience, do you find Gizmo to be reliable? At times, yes. And at other times, not? Correct. And so you've responded to many calls of which the address was not correct, provided from Gizmo, correct? Mm, that I can think of off the top of my head, not many. <coughs> In your training and experience, when you receive these addresses from Gizmo, are you to receive these addresses and understand them to be accurate, or is it do you know them that it is possible that when they are triangulated, that might not be the exact address? I guess what you're saying, yeah, if it doesn't, I don't know how it works. Again, I'm not a tech person. I don't know how the computer thing gets the address. I don't know how the cell tower does it. So I understand that. I understand that. I want to know from your state of mind upon arriving at the scene, when you receive an address through Gizmo, do you receive that address and think this is the address 100% or do you know that there's an, a margin of error? There possibly can be a margin of error, yes. Okay. And so when you arrived and you saw uh, an individual in the garage, you spoke with him and his wife, correct? Correct. And did you rule them out as being the 911 caller? I ruled out the fact that no one was injured there and cleared the call. Okay. No and one called police, no one needed assistance. At that point in time leaving the house, did you have any concern that possibly this phone call came from another address? At that time, no. 
No um, again, speaking about Gizmo, um, I know I've had calls where people are walking and it pings somewhere and I show up in that area, do an area check. Um, I had issues finding the address originally, so I did drive up and down that street and didn't hear any screaming, yelling, didn't see anyone running outside for help. Um, approximately how many times did you drive up and down the street? Probably once circled back and then, so yeah, if you count one, two like that. So just in and out. Up, around, past it, came back. So one, two, and parked to make contact. Okay, so it sounds like you went back and forth at least twice. Yes. And in doing so, your partner indicated she had her window down. Did you also have your window down? Um, I believe I was driving, so cracks, usually spotlight on, again, trying to look for an address, the number. And the numbers are listed on the curb, correct? That I can't recall. Now, you said that from the scene, you then later responded to the hospital, correct? Correct. And upon arriving at the hospital, you made contact with Mr. Corey Thomas? I did. And Ms. Christy McIndick? Yes, I did. Okay. And is it your job to obtain statements uh, upon arriving at the scene? If they're able to give them, yes. Okay. And if they're not able to give them, then you, is it common for you to write their statements down? At times, yes. Okay. And uh, who took down a written statement from Corey Thomas? Officer Truex did. And you also spoke with Mr. Thomas, correct? Yes, I did. And in the police report, it indicates that there was an audio statement. McIndate completed the voluntary statement by audio interview. Did you conduct that? No, I did not. Do you know who conducted that? I do not. I know it was one of the detectives, but it was not me. And how do you know it was one of the detectives? From the transcript and the Police reports. I'm sorry, you said from the transcripts? What transcripts are you referring to? The, from her, her audio voluntary, recorded voluntary statement that she gave to a detective. Did you take down any written statement by Christine McIndoe? As in the same as Officer Truex did? Just for clarification is what your question is. Um, why don't you describe exactly what statement you did take down? Um, not the, the words of the statement, but in speaking with her, did you have a notepad or a computer? Did you take down In statement? speaking with her, I typed down, wrote down what she was saying. And approximately how long did you speak with her for? Again, I was kind of back and forth, in and out with medical staff working on her. Calling my sergeant, it just, I can't give you an exact number. I can't tell you how long I was at the hospital either. Okay. And then after leaving the hospital, did you go back to the scene? Yes, I did. And what did you do when you arrived at the scene? Contacted my sergeant. Did you get out of the vehicle? Yes, I did. And you said it was a crime scene, so you were not able to go in the house, correct? Correct. Was anybody in the house at the time that you were on scene? That I don't know. Do you recall at the time of showing back up, was there any yellow tape out? Yes, there was. And did you put that tape out? No, I did not. Okay. And do you recall whether or not there was dogs present at the scene? No, I don't. Now, in the dispatch logs, it says that Jonathan was last seen in the gray or blue Prius uh, bearing the license plate, and then it gives a license plate number. Um, were you the one that took those notes? That was updated by a unit who originally arrived at the house. Is that information you took and entered? Yes, that I wrote in the police report, yes. Okay. And where was he last seen at? To my knowledge, at the residence. And do you know who he was last seen by? Christie's my guess. Now, do you hear the dispatch calls to say something? 
Depends, usually yes. And do you recall hearing a dispatch uh, of which what appeared to be Mr. Copenhaver's vehicle uh, coming back down the street when officers were on scene? No. You don't recall that? No. Nothing further than Redirect. Right. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> All right, why don't we go ahead and take a lunch break till 1.30? During this recess, you're admonished not to talk or converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this trial, or to read, watch, or listen to any report of or commentary on the trial, or any person connected with this trial, by any medium of information, including without limitation newspapers, television, the internet, or radio, or to form or express any opinion on any subject connected with this trial until the case is finally submitted to you. Jurors are excused. Counsel, stay a minute. All rise. Right.